Uh, the answer is mostly no. <laughs> there are, I mean, there are some countries that perhaps are are doing a bit better than others in the sense that they invest much more in long-term care and the formal long-term care system represents a bigger share of their economy. But of course, um, uh, as I said, the COVID pandemic did highlight the, the fact that most systems have a lot of room for improvement. And in fact, the European uh, Union has now got a, a European strategy for care, which never it's never there before. And this is to, to raise awareness and also to, to support countries, I think, in being a bit braver about um, improving their long term care systems. One of the things that the need for long term care does or sometimes the need to provide uh, care to family members is that it exacerbates inequalities. So the risk of uh, having a need for long term care is not equally distributed. Normally people who are wealthier and have had, uh, let's say, uh, an easier life uh, age better. And if they need care, they need it perhaps later in life. And also we find that the people who tend to provide family care, especially the people who give up their work or don't work, and then to because they have family responsibilities that are not met through the public system, for example, tend to be those who are worse off. So we find that the very wealthy can meet their needs when they need care. It's not such a problem for them, but uh, everyone else uh, finds it very difficult. And in fact, when I say everyone else, I mean anyone from a medium <laughs> economic level uh, is, is only those very wealthy who are really um, free of problems when it comes to the need for long term care. And we find, of course, that especially where women give up work to provide care and then say uh, in their, usually in their 50s, then afterwards they try to come back to the labor market. There are some uh, really important studies from the US and from Germany that shows that it takes almost five years to get back into, into work for these women. And when they do go back to work, they go back at a lower level of salary than they had before they left. And this has a really important impact on their future pensions. And this means that in a way we are going to 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 have a poverty in old age for for people because they sacrificed their careers to provide care the healthcare systems are not really oriented towards prevention uh, and uh, and of course it's not it's not only prevention is not only something that the healthcare system does but i think the healthcare system can really support it so what i mean by that is that if you live in a place where you're able to go out um, and you're not afraid of getting out of your house if it's a pleasant place to walk you're more likely to to do exercise and, and also if you live closer to Paris, there's also very than showing that. But also we know that uh, for somebody who's living in a flat without a lift, when they start to have mobility problems, it's very likely that those people also stop uh, going out. And this will exacerbate their health problems because the less you exercise, the worse you age. So that's uh, that's one example, for example, where Prevention is, is a multifaceted thing that goes from the environment to housing. And then, of course, as I said, the role of the health system. There's a lot that we can do to reduce dependency. Um, we can manage better long term conditions and we can also try to detect them early before they get worse. And we see that some countries like uh, Denmark, uh, Japan, Korea are, have introduced um, health checks for people in their 70s. And these are visits that they do. They go to people's houses and they check how they're doing and they check if there's something that can be done to help them age better. And I think this is really important. The health systems are more oriented towards spending in hospitals and hospital care rather than prevention and, and supporting the community. I think more in investment in community nursing would be really important. And I do hope that this is the way in which things will evolve because we have aging societies and we need different type of health system for that. 
And with regards to pensions, of course, and again, and I'll mention again, housing, these are really important aspects because, of course, the, if you add poverty to the need for care, then it is all so much more complex. So what we observed is that the better organized the care systems were before the pandemic, the easier it was to respond to the pandemic. So we have seen quite important differences in the ability to respond in different countries. And I think the more fragmented the governance of the care system was before the pandemic, the harder it was to establish who was responsible and who was in charge of, of the response. And similarly, there's all sorts of infrastructure uh, elements that were very important. So where you had a strong community-based uh, care system, it was easier to support older people, people with disabilities dependency who are living in their own homes. And, um, and, and, and it's really important because in some countries they couldn't identify who to give the vaccines to when it came or, or uh, personal protection equipment because they had no data. Care homes that we have are not suitable even for the standards of care that we'd wish to see in the present and let alone the future. And uh, we have seen that, for example, many care homes didn't have very good training or policies in place for infection prevention. Um, this was very different in Asia, but in most of Europe and uh, Canada, the US, well, Middle Income countries, we didn't have that preparation. We've also seen that the type of buildings that we're using are not really good. Um, we also saw that many more people died when people were sharing rooms, when there were also shared bathrooms, whereas in places where you had, um, like in Denmark, where you had an, an apartment where you could, uh, where you had your own toilet, your own little kitchen, your own living room, your own bedroom, and even access to the outside, it was much easier to implement the hygiene measures that we needed to keep the virus at, at bay while maintaining a good quality of life. Um, because in many cases, people were isolated in their own bedrooms for very long periods of time. The lack of access to the outside without going through the entire care home meant that visits were restricted much more severely than perhaps was necessary and, that, that, and definitely more <laughs> restricted than was good for the mental health of both the people who live in the care homes and their relatives. So I think we have um, a lot to learn. So we really need to modernize care homes in most countries. One very important lesson from the pandemic was that the type of care homes we had didn't work. And we saw how these more modern settings that actually enable people to live in their own space, in, the, in their own way, which were much more important. I think perhaps we need to consider how we can separate the living element from the care element. So I think we can have um, housing provided that is adapted, that has some support services, and then make sure that people can receive intensive home care if they need it in the same way as if they continue it in their own home. Most people who are receiving home care in most countries don't receive enough of it. And uh, that's because we put a lot of limits on how much, or perhaps there are very high co-payments that put people off from using um, the hours that they need to be able to live well in their own homes. And that may push people into care homes unnecessarily. And that's not great because we are effectively um, having to provide housing to people who already had it, but when they move into a care home, they ha we have to pay for both their housing and their care, whereas if they could stay in their own home, the only cost would be the cost of care. I also think we have an opportunity to make care homes less institutional-like, but it is hard to, to make this change happen. I think there is a lot of reluctance to, info, to, to see the value of investing more in home help in many counties or perhaps consider taking out co-payments. And we also have the fact that it's uh, cheaper to mass produce accommodation uh, with uh, very little personal space for the people who live there. And uh, what I expect is that um, 
the new generations that are aging will not want to live like that. And I do fear that there may be at the moment a lot of investment in in buildings that are already obsolete now, let alone in 10 years. I think there are some excellent examples where technology is really helping, uh, but I don't think it uh, has its shown itself yet to be a substitution for humans and uh, I think it's an extremely valuable tool. It can maybe help us be more efficient in, in some cases and uh, in the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care we have a very active data science group and they are now exploring these, exploring for example the use of AI uh, for case notes for social workers with um, not just using chat GBT, but using very specialized models that um, that are also of course secure and uh, but there are also limits and there are all sorts of biases that these systems introduce that we need to fully understand. Uh, so, so from my point of view, it's great to see us working on this and I think that the more we can ensure that some of the tasks that are more routine can be made, uh, can be done through technology and then ensure that there's enough um, time for the relational care but also the personal care. And I'd like to emphasize here how a lot of the tasks that care workers do, in fact the majority, are to do with personal care. And by personal care we mean giving people, so helping people eat. So, you know, and uh, I know there's some, I've actually seen some robots that seem to do this okay, but it's not easy. So say a person with dementia that has difficulty swallowing, I mean, how, how can you leave a robot in charge when this person could choke and die? Um, the other a huge, huge issue in terms of the tasks that are done are to do with continents and bathing and how can you, you know, then there may be a robot that can help, help you move a person or, or put them in position so that just one worker can do the lifting and the lowering into a bath. We can have innovations in that, but you still need a human to, to be there. So I think that they're a great complement, uh, but not uh, a substitution for humans. I think we will see that that will become more aware of the need to, to have a good care system. So more of us will want to vote for the politicians who think about this. And I think it's always useful to look at countries that have aged faster already. So if we look at Japan, Korea, Singapore, there's a lot that we can learn from how they have embraced aging, how they've accepted that they're an aging population and they're designing their public policies around that. And I'd expect to see more countries catching up on this. So what Japan and Korea have done, as well as other countries, is to recognize that they needed to invest more in the care system. It was difficult to do that through taxation because it would have meant cutting down on spending on other public policies. So what they did was to create a long-term care insurance that was designed to be parallel to the health insurance system where people pay additional contributions to support long-term care. And that means that they've been able to increase the, the expenditure in long-term care by having an additional financing for other countries like Denmark uh, haven't done that or Norway, um, the Netherlands, what they have done is to increase their public system so they could fund more care. And what they have also done, and we're seeing also that uh, happening in Finland at the moment, is that they what they have done is to address the governance of care and to have some important reforms, even on the size of the local authorities that are in charge of care, so they're big enough to be able to take on this responsibility. And I do think that sorting out uh, these uh, policies of governance financing are key for any of the other improvements we want to see. I think that if you don't put your house in order and establish a clear financing route and a clear uh, responsibility for care, then you may be stuck in a vicious circle of always blaming the other administrations for not having enough funding for care or for not doing enough or not doing things well enough. I think we need some brave reforms and I do think this also requires some careful work of building alliances across 
different political colors and uh, different parties because you can't really do these very substantial changes just in one legislature typically.